Good morning, church. It is great to see you today. I uh, am really glad to look out and see some long-lost friends that have come back, Mike and Joanne Wright. Uh, They have moved down south and back here to visit with us again today. It's great to see you all. I'm excited about the next couple of weeks, as Alex mentioned, uh, as we think about into April, Friends Day on April the 10th, and we're going to have a sort of a family day right after our service outside, weather permitting. Be a lot of things going on, especially for the kids, so uh, you want to tell your friends that when you invite them, pray about who the Lord wants you to invite for that day, April 10th. And then the two services, don't forget, mark that down, the two services for the celebration of the resurrection of Christ on the 17th, 8.30 and 10.15. I want you to take your Bibles with you today and turn with me to the book of Matthew in chapter 27, Matthew chapter 27. You might want to follow along and maybe underline a sort of circle a verse along the way. As you're turning there, you just, you know, want to th- thinking about some of my uh, favorite uh, television shows uh, on television, and, and maybe it's the same with you. I kind of like the shows, the, the, the dramas that I'm watching, when, when the bad guy gets caught you know, when they sort of nail him at the end of the show. Back when I was growing up, it was shows like Columbo, and now it's shows like Blue Bloods that's on, I believe, Friday night. Shows where the bad guy gets it, like I said, in the last, you know, 10 to 15 minutes of the episode. You know it's winding down. You know he's going to get nailed. And we want to see good and responsible people rewarded and foolish, irresponsible people having to pay the price sort of reap what they sow. That just sort of makes sense to us. And more than that, it becomes, I don't know, maybe a little bit irksome when great things happen to people who really in no way deserve it or haven't earned it. And I think of some other television shows along that line. For instance, there's one that my, my folks watch on Saturday night, and sometimes I'll watch it with them. Uh, it's uh, that, that show where people just randomly pick three numbers on a screen, and in a minute, they can earn more than your annual income, right? You know, and you think, well, what's that all about? I mean, uh, there's no pleasure in their happiness when it comes to winning money that way. Instead of a show like Cash Explosion, wouldn't it be so much more fun if we saw a show instead that was like, oh, let's say called Lose Your Inheritance, Right? And really wealthy people, I don't know, people like maybe Prince Charles or somebody like that, people who haven't worked for their fortune would come on the show and all they could do was lose their money, right? I mean, who wouldn't want to watch a show like that? You could have music like they have on the Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, da, da, da. you know, Who Wants to Lose Their Inheritance? Or maybe you've seen that news show that's on NBC, it's called Courtship, A Woman Tired of Modern Dating has been whisked away to an elegant countryside castle. She's done nothing to earn this, but she's whisked away to it and live in, in clothed in garments of royalty where eligible, handsome suitors try to woo her to, to choose them. And what if instead of a royal regal castle, it took place, let's say, uh, I don't know, in a trailer park. And uh, they, they, they got married, and, and they, she became as Sammy... Kershaw sang about 20 years or so ago, the, the queen of the double wide trailer with, with polyester curtains and a redwood deck. That would probably be more realistic because there's something, I don't know, to, to deep down to some of us, a, a little bit annoying when great things happen to people who haven't done anything to earn it unless, of course, that person is us, right? <laughs> but that's exactly what happens to our character on the road to the cross today. If you haven't been with us, we've been in this series, Characteristics on the Road to Calvary. And we're looking at characters in the story of the cross and drawing out a characteristic that we can apply to our life today, 2,000 years later. Last week, if you were here, you might remember we left Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, being betrayed by Judas. And immediately he's whisked away and he's put on trial. Not just once, not twice, but six times that night he'll be before judges. 
Finally, he appears a second time before Pontius Pilate, a last time, and that's where we meet our character today, Barabbas. Usually when we think of the gospel story and something happening to people who have done nothing to earn it, we can go directly to Jesus, this this perfectly innocent son of God who is brutally uh, crucified on the cross. But what about Barabbas? What about this guilty murderer who is set free? I mean, this sort of seems pretty unjust to me, doesn't it to you? To be honest with you, we don't know a whole lot about this guy, Barabbas. All four gospel writers, though, do speak of him, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And when we put them all together, here's the picture that we see that we can put on the screen. He was a well-known or notorious prisoner, depending on what version you're using there. Luke chapter 23, verse 19 tells us he was an insurrectionist, and he committed murder. An insurrectionist back then was not a madman. He wasn't a madman. He was someone that had politically motivated crimes. He wanted to overthrow the Roman government and their hold on the Jewish people. Some versions of John 18, 40 tell us he was a robber or a thief. So you get the idea, well-known prisoner, committed murder, thief. He's a bad guy. He's the kind of guy you want to see get it in the end. If you're watching a movie on the life of Barabbas, what keeps you going through the movie is the thought, in the last 10 minutes, Barabbas is going to get nailed. What I want us to do is look at a day in the life of Barabbas here, if we could. By the time Barabbas comes on the scene, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus is in his sixth and final trials, I said. He's standing before Pontius Pilate in a place that John calls the pavement. Pilate has tried a number of different maneuvers to get off the hook with Jesus. Pilate saw Jesus as a no-win situation. He didn't want to have to deal with him. He sees him on one hand as an innocent man. Even his wife has had a dream about Jesus, said don't have anything to do with him. He's an innocent man. You don't want his blood on your hands, Pilate. And uh, he sort of looks at Jesus and sees that innocence here, and he doesn't want to sentence him to death. On the other hand, Pilate, the consummate politician, is afraid of the Jewish leaders. If he doesn't comply with their wishes, if he doesn't do what they want him to do, they could use the riot among the Jewish people uh, as a, a word to get back to Rome that Pilate's unable to keep control of Jerusalem. He's in trouble, and he might well lose his position as governor if he doesn't do what they say. So Pilate's in a pickle here, and he tries a few things. Here's the first thing he does. Pilate says, you know what? Jesus is from Galilee, and so that's out of my jurisdiction. I'm going to send him to Herod. That's really Herod's area. And so he sends Jesus to Herod. And Herod looks at Jesus as a plaything. He, he just wants to mess around with Jesus. And Jesus is completely silent, doesn't speak a word when he's before Herod. And then Herod tires of this, and he sends him back to Pilate. So Pilate reasons, well, maybe instead of killing him, you know, the people would settle down if I just had him beaten really badly. And so he orders Jesus to be flogged. Listen to how Mark Moore describes a flogging back then. The victim was tied to the post or hung from a wall. Either method drew the muscles taut across the victim's back. The soldier would then use a cat of nine tails. It was a short wooden stick with nine thong strands attached to it. And at the end of each strand was tied something sharp, bone, metal, glass. The soldier would attempt to rake the victim's back with the sharp objects, literally shredding the muscles of the back and the legs. So much muscle was left shredded and hanging that a victim's vertebrae was exposed. Often the tails would whip around the victim's face, gouging out the eyes. It's not surprising then, uh, Moore says, that the flogging alone was lethal. It killed six out of ten times. Now Pilate brings the bloody, beaten body of Jesus back out in front of this mob. He says to himself, you know, surely this will appease them. Surely this will be enough, but it's not. They call again for his death. And in the midst of all this, Pilate sees something here that might be able to help him. There's a custom that they have at this time at the festival of the Passover to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. So again, Pilate, the consummate politician, thinks this is my out. And he reasons, you know, who could I put up against Jesus that they would choose Jesus to be released over this criminal? And he has a whole bunch to choose from, and he chooses this guy Barabbas. Why? Because Matthew chapter 27, verse 16 tells us that he is a notorious or a well-known prisoner. Not well-loved, but he's well-known. Pilate 
would have known who he was. Surely these people wouldn't want this guy back on the street, right? Besides that, Pilate would have known what had taken place just a few days before. This is early Friday morning when Jesus is before Pilate. The past Sunday, just five days before, Jesus has had the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And you know, remember what happened there? You know, the people just you know, praised Jesus, and they, 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 they loved Jesus at that time. So Pilate comes to, to the crowd, and he says, Who do you want me to release to you? Who do you want me to let go? Let's pick it up in Matthew 27 and verse 17 in our text. It says, So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus, Barabbas, or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of envy that they had handed Jesus over to them. Pilate knew that the Jewish leaders were, were, were jealous of Jesus' popularity with the crowd. That's why he had been handed over to him. Surely the people wouldn't go along with that. But look at verse 20 in our text here in Matthew chapter 27. The chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do with then Jesus who is called the Christ? They answered together, crucify him. Now, like I just said, this is Friday. Five days earlier, this same group of people had laid clothing on the road in front of Jesus. They'd strewn palm branches on the road, you know, praising him. Matthew chapter 21, verse 9, here's what it had said. The crowds went ahead of him. Those that had followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heavens. That was Sunday. This is Friday. Sunday they had said, crying out, Bless him. Now they're crying out, crucify him. Think about that. Maybe there's somebody here this morning that's worried about pleasing somebody else and that other person's not walking with God. They're not right with God. Listen, don't live to please people. People pleasing puts that person in place of God. People are fickle. They'll love you today and leave you tomorrow. Only God will never leave you or forsake you. Maybe sometimes we need to just stop and ask with the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, these, th this question, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Now, one commentator points out that Barabbas would have been imprisoned in a place called the Fortress of Antonia. This is where all the prisoners would have been kept in ancient Jerusalem. Now, when Jesus is standing before Pilate, like I said, John tells us he's at a place called the pavement. This is an elevated stone area outside of where Pilate would have been staying when he came to town. Here's the question. How far is the pavement from the fortress of Antonia? It's about 2,000 2, feet. It's little less than half a mile. In other words, it's, it's too far, too far away for Barabbas to hear what Pilate is saying, but it's not too far away for him to hear what the mob is shouting. So I want us to do something here that may help us hear what Barabbas heard from his prison cell. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to play the part of Pilate, and I want you to play the part of the crowd. The crowd. I'm going to say, who do you want me to release to you? And I want you to say real loud, Barabbas, Barabbas. And then I'm going to ask the question, what shall then I do with Jesus? And I want you to say real loud, crucify him, crucify him. So after the first question, you shout out, Barabbas, Barabbas. And after the second one, crucify him, crucify him. All right? Who do you want me to release to you? What then shall I do with Jesus? Now that's what Barabbas would have heard, the loud parts. Barabbas, crucify him. And I bet he's thinking back there where he's at, at the fortress of Antonia. Wait a minute. This is the end. They're going to come and they're going to take off my clothes and they're going to tie me to a tree, nail me to a tree. And knowing the kind of man that Barabbas probably was, he's thinking to himself, if I'm going down, I'm going to try to take as many of those guys as I can with me. So the prison door slams open and Barabbas sits there chained up, but he's calm. Maybe they come over to him, and the moment they unleash his chains, he's in a frenzy, and he's fighting for his life, and there's a great struggle that happens, and they're going back and forth, and finally one of the soldiers shouts, Barabbas, Barabbas, you're free, you're free. And it takes a moment for it to sort of sink in, and one of the soldiers explains, somebody else is dying on your cross. 
Somebody else has taken your place. That's where our story ends with Barabbas. Maybe that's not the way we would have ended it if we were writing the story. Maybe we would have made Barabbas this innocent family man and Jesus comes and, and, and releases him and sets him free and it sounds so much nobler that way, doesn't it? But that's not who Barabbas was. He was guilty. The gospel writers make that clear. He's this notorious thief and murderer. Barabbas did nothing to earn his pardon. And as far as we know, he didn't even ask for it. There's no appeal for clemency. There's no promise of atonement. There's no really guarantee of good behavior in the future. So Barabbas, here he stands free. And some think Barabbas was a cohort of the other two thieves that were crucified, one on either side of Jesus. And if so, Friday was going to be his crucifixion day, but instead he's pardoned. And he's done nothing to receive the gift. He's completely and utterly undeserving. I wonder what Barabbas did, by the way, after he was set free. Did he run out and hook back up with his old cronies, the old crowd? Did he run like a scalded dog and get out of town before they changed their mind? Or did he maybe slink over and stand at the foot of the cross and whisper to himself, I don't know who you are, but one thing I do know, you're there dying in my place. Barabbas missed his punishment that day because another man literally took his place. Does that sound familiar? We're all undeserving of God's grace. Jesus is on his way to the cross to become the substitutionary atonement for our sins. But it's difficult for us each to, to know what substitutionary atonement means to us. It's such a big term. And here we get the picture. Enter Barabbas. Of all the characters that surround the crucifixion story, Judas, Peter, Mary, we could go down the line here. This is the one we know the least about, but this is the one we're most like. If this story was a play and I had to choose one character that, that I'd have to be in the whole story of the cross, like you, I, I, I'd have to choose Barabbas, the guilty man Jesus dies for. You see, what Jesus did for Barabbas, he did for us even to a greater degree. No, Jesus not only was his substitute, he's our substitute. I, I love the way it puts it in Scripture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 10, one version says, Jesus, who died for us. He died for sin. He was the sacrifice, but he died in place of the sinner. He was the substitute. All of the way Galatians 3 verse 13 puts it. It says, Christ took away the curse the law put on us. He changed places with us and put himself under the curse. You remember the Passion of the Christ movie that came out, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago? You remember the scene where Jesus is about to be nailed to the cross, and what you might not know is the left hand that is holding that nail and that is about to be driven through the hand of Christ is the hand of the director of the movie, Mel Gibson. It's the only place in the movie where Gibson appears, and the reason he wanted his hand in that shot and his words were these, I'm first in line for crucifying Jesus. I did it. What he's saying is, I understand that Jesus was a substitute death for me. Someone put it like this, the essence of sin is man substituting himself for God. The essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. If there were a Cliff Notes version of the Bible, it would have to be this verse, Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. It goes like this, the wages of sin is death. What it's saying there is this, we're all chains in chains, on death row. We're all Barabbas. But the gift of God's eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus took our place and set us free. He set us free. There are three biblical concepts that are woven all throughout Scripture. And, and it, you've heard them at different times in, 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 in messages. But here's what they are. The, the three concepts are justice, mercy, and grace. In justice, we get what we deserve. You've heard the, the line, you, you do the crime, you do the time, right? It's deserved punishment. Mercy is when you, you, you don't get what you deserve. You're exempted from the punishment. Grace is when we get something we don't deserve. We get favor, we get undeserved love when punishment is deserved. And maybe we could think of it this way to make it practical. Let's say after church, you're so excited about the sermon 
So excited that as you talk to people in your car about it on the way home, you don't realize you're speeding. And you get pulled over for going 75 in a 55. And justice is getting pulled over and receiving the ticket. Mercy is the officer letting you go with just a warning. Not that that's happened to anybody here before, right? And grace would be, grace would be the officer writing the ticket and then him imploring you to have you hand it back to him so he can pay it for you. Now that's grace, and that's also not going to happen in your future, but it already did happen in your past. We deserve death because of our sin, but God came down in Jesus Christ and paid the penalty for our sin himself and set us free. There's a movie that came out several years ago called The Last Emperor. In this movie, a young child is anointed as the last emperor of China, and he lives this magical life with a thousand servants at his command. And one day his brother asks him, what happens when you do something wrong? He says, when I do something wrong... A servant gets punished, and to demonstrate, he breaks a vase, and immediately someone comes and, and badly beats one of the thousand servants. Now, friend, that's grace, but you just have to, to reverse it. When the servants erred, the king takes the punishment. Grace is free only because the giver has borne the cost. Grace is free, but listen, listen, it is not cheap. It is not cheap. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 says, In Christ we're set free by the blood of his death, so we have forgiveness of sins. How rich is God's grace? My relationship with God starts with me grasping that truth. Listen, in his mercy, a God of justice has extended me grace, his undeserved love. Maybe this will help us. Some time ago I shared with you two possible ways that people can relate to God. One way is the way of law, okay? Now, by law, we mean whatever commandments of God that apply to anyone at any time. In the Old Testament, there's the law of Moses, but the Bible's full of commands from Genesis to Revelation. God's a God of law and order. He created the universe to operate according to certain natural laws and for people to live according to his moral laws of Scripture. And if I come to God and relate to him at that level, there are certain ground rules he's established. There you see him on the screen. Keep the commandment. Escape the penalty, break the commandment, suffer the penalty. That's the way law operates. We understand that. We may even say, well, that's fair. So, okay, God, I'm going to keep God's law and escape the penalty. A whole lot of people I know try to relate to God that way, by the, by the way. They have the, the scales approach. And in the end, they're thinking, you know, if I'm 52% good and 48% bad, I, I, I get in. I deserve it. I've earned it. Reader's Digest had a story some time ago about a 67-year-old man named Bill who had given over 100 pints of his own blood. And there's no doubt, you know, he had saved a lot of people with his kindness. But here's Bill's motivation. Listen to what he says to Reader's Digest. He says, when the final whistle blows and St. Peter asks, what did you do? He said, I will say I gave 100 pints of blood. That ought to get me in. Now, I don't know if he's messing around or, or what, but if Bill is counting on 100 pints of blood to get him into heaven, then Bill's trusting in the wrong blood. Here's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 24. We're all justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ, his blood, not mine. See, here's the problem. When I try to relate to God, this holy God of the universe, on the basis of law, just being a good person, my own righteousness getting me into heaven because I've deserved it, I need to understand there's no righteous, the Bible says, not even one. And look, look at this verse. This one's troubling if I try to approach God that way. Whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. If, if I break just one one of God's laws, I'm as guilty as the person who's broken a thousand. I'm a lawbreaker before a holy God. One mess up forfeits everything. So do we don't want the way of the law. Please, God, is there another way? And the Bible says there is, the way of grace. Grace operates on a totally different way of relating to God and a totally different, entirely different set of ground rules. Under grace, here are the terms. Keep the law, suffer the penalty. Break the law, escape the penalty. We say, praise the Lord, right? Under grace, a lawbreaker, a sinner like you and me, we can escape the penalty of eternal separation from God. But we look at that and we say, wait, wait a minute. Something doesn't seem right there, right? 
<laughs> I mean, why should someone, the first part, who keeps the law suffer the penalty and the one who breaks the law escape the penalty? That doesn't seem fair, and it doesn't, right? But let me ask you, do you really want God to be fair with you? I, for one, do not. The Bible says the wages of sin, what I deserve because of my sin, is death, eternal separation for God. I'm thankful God isn't fair with me. I'm, for one, thrilled that we're not operating before a holy, perfect, righteous judge of the universe on the basis of what's fair. It's not fair. It's not supposed to be. If it was fair, it wouldn't be grace. So we say, okay, we can accept the second part, break the law, escape the penalty. That's the only hope we have. But what about that first rule? Keep the law, suffer the penalty? That's not fair either. Who in the world would choose to do that? Who in the world would ever completely keep all of God's laws and then willingly accept a penalty for it? And we know today that there was one. And we meet here today in his name every Sunday. We gather around his table, Jesus. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says this, Been tempted, he was in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Even though he perfectly kept God's law, he willingly suffered its penalty. He suffered the full penalty of breaking God's law in our place. He allowed himself to be treated like a sinner so that we could be treated as God's son. God made him, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He became what we are so that we could become, in essence, what he is, a child of God. See, here's the difference in law and grace. Under law, no penalty is given to the person who's 100% good. Under grace, no penalty as you come to accept Jesus Christ. When you accept the gift, no penalty is given to the person who's now 100% forgiven. 100% good? or 100% forgiven. So here we are this morning. Here we are in the story on the road to the cross. And it's Jesus, the son of the living God, versus Barabbas, a thug and a rebel. And Pilate asks, okay, who do you want? There's no comparison here. Here's a rightful prisoner, a man who should be on death row. He's a murderer, a bad man, a robber, a crook. He deserves the chains. He deserves the punishment. Jesus, what has he done but, but heal? What has he done but open uh, deaf ears and blind eyes? What has Jesus done? Who do you want? We want Barabbas. Yeah, give us Barabbas. And one of the soldiers comes up and sticks the key in and unlocks Barabbas from his chains and his shackles, and he walks down the platform, welcomed by all his thug friends. Yeah, people love me. I don't even know who this Jesus guy is, but all I know is that people love me. Get a load of this guy. There's no scripture that says he turns back to Jesus and says, I owe you everything. There's no thank you. No, I owe you my life. And Jesus stands there and says, it's fine, Father. I'll do your will, Father. Let them have Barabbas. For Jesus knew, Jesus knew that the Father would have to treat Jesus like Barabbas so he could treat Barabbas like Jesus. Barabbas thought it was the people that sent him free. No, it was the love of a heavenly father. See, when I look at this story, I've got to realize who Barabbas really is. Barabbas is you and he's me. He had every right to die. No one would have blinked an eye. And so do we spiritually. So do we for all eternity. Never forget those were the chains of sin and death around your wrists. Never forget it was Jesus who took the key and set you free. A preacher by the name of Matt Chandler tells a story about when he was a freshman in Bible college. He met a young single mom named Kim, and he and some of his friends in seminary wanted to introduce her to God. So one night, Matt invites her to go to this Christian concert with him, and after the band plays, a preacher got up, and the preacher talked about sex, and right out of the gate, he's angry. And he starts talking about STDs and statistics, and he holds out a red rose, and the rose is new and beautiful and looks at it, and 
sniffs it, and it's really nice, and it's pretty, and he talks about how good it smells, and then he throws it to the crowd, and he says, I want you to pass it around. I want everybody to look at this, smell it, to touch the rose, and then I'll have you bring it back up to me later. And so he continues to preach and pointing his finger and raising his voice, and Matt says he sat next to Kim, this single young mom with a pretty rough past, didn't know anything about God. She just had her head down in shame. The preacher concluded his sermon by saying, now someone bring that rose back up to me. I need the rose back up her, and they bring the rose back up to the preacher, but now it looks something, well, something like this, completely broken. The petals are tattered and worn. The preacher holds up the broken flower, says, now who would want this? It's been handled, it's been broken, it doesn't even smell like a rose. Who would want this? Nobody wants this, nobody would buy this. And Matt's sitting next to this young lady, and he said that everything within him wanted to just stand up and yell, Jesus wants that rose. Jesus bought that rose. That's the whole point of the gospel. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we could become the righteousness of God through him. That's the whole reason Jesus came to make things new. The whole reason Jesus came was to take what's broken and turn it into something beautiful. That's what the whole message is about. Jesus wants the broken rose, and there's a word for that. The word is grace. I hope Barabbas realized that. I hope, better yet, you've received that, are living in light of that. Grace, could it be that there's a God with a love so scandalous, so wide, so deep, so high, so expansive? Let me take those chains, child. Let me take that sin while I, Jesus, take your beating, your pain, your shame, your death. Where do we get off thinking that we're ever going to set ourselves free? Where do we get off thinking we could ever earn that or deserve that? By grace, you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. That grace is the gift of God. It's always been Jesus. It still is Jesus. It will never stop being Jesus. And if you haven't accepted his sacrifice for you, if you haven't accepted Jesus as your Savior, been baptized into him, if you've been putting that off, would you let this be the day where you humbly come and accept the greatest gift of all? And if you've already done that, maybe this is the day you need to repent, the day you need to come back and get in a close walk with God and quit dabbling around with the very thing Jesus died for the day you say enough because Jesus you are enough Sherry's going to play softly here for us for a moment she's playing the chorus of a song words of poetry that were written over a hundred years ago by Julia Johnson the words go like this, sin and despair like the sea waves cold threaten the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold, points to the refuge, the mighty cross. You probably know the chorus much better. I want to see if you would sing it with me. Grace, grace. God's grace. Let's sing this together. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon, cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace. Let's pray.